I'm going to make, uh, uh, I'm going to do the discuss, discussant thing and um, uh, try and weave together uh, this morning and this afternoon. I wasn't asked to weave together this morning, but it's so important to what we've talked about this afternoon that I think um, I'll give it a try. Let's see what happens. Um, I think it was 2014 that I came to Angie uh, with Peter Mangione and, and Chelsea Bailey. I had been asked to come to China and uh, conduct a panel on play. And we worked very hard before we got here. Um, and then the day before we did the big talk, we were taken to Angie. And the rest is history. I, I, uh, we started that next morning and I said, and Chelsea said, and Peter said, each in our own way, we shouldn't be up here, Mrs. Chen should be up here. Um, we learned so much just in that one day um, of seeing the centers and we knew that anything we had to say w would pale in comparison to what we had just seen. I have carried Angie in my heart ever since then and would feel so lucky to be here again um, observing and, and being part of it um, and seeing the seeing that the world now knows about it. I write about it in all the things that I write about, which is not early childhood. I write about teacher education. Um, but Angie is a model for me about what can possibly happen with adults who really, really come to understand the importance of preparing environments for children's learning. So I want to begin by telling you after that, just the little history that brought me here, um, that one of the very most powerful things I think that we have to think about as we take um, play, the notion of Angie play, to other parts of the world. I'm old enough to tell you that I fell in love with the Brit British infant schools back in the mid-60s and tried to create that kind of thing myself. And one of the things that I learned, I, I developed wonderful schools, but they were the rust version of a British infant school. They were an American uh, woman's version of a British infant school. That's the best I could do. And one of the things that I think Doris talked about today was understanding the context in which you're going to develop this work and trying to pull on the big ideas. So as I created the schools that, that I did, one of the, th I had to learn how to hold on to the big ideas that had drawn me to developing an open classroom, a multi-age classroom, a classroom where children had time, as I saw in Angie, to learn and to play and to make choices. So the children that I worked with, this was in the olden days when you could just have preschool for three hours a day and not all day. Um, and so two hours of that time was free choice on the part of the children. But I was also trained in Montessori. I never did a Montessori school because I'd fallen in love with the British Infant School. I couldn't do both. But what I learned from Montessori was the notion of preparing an environment for what you want to see happen. And that's what I see in Angie. There are big ideas that are operative here and that, that are governing the way all of this is set up. And among those, you have the five qualities of play. But autonomy on the part of the child, the development of self-regulation is critical to what's going on here. And that is the work of the adults 
in this group, to make that possible for children to take that on. I think um, that what I learned in the, in the olden days of the British Infant School and, and that whole movement towards the open classroom was that we tried to adopt what we saw, but we didn't understand. And that's the power of, of what's going on here, too. I said to Peter Mangione that it is so much richer what I'm seeing now than I saw five years ago. And five years ago, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Um, and I think that has to do with what the adults are learning about this amazing work. As a teacher educator, I have to tell you that this is incredibly hard, particularly for early childhood, to help people apprehend working in a different way than they have been taught. It's remarkable that this is happening. I say to my students, mostly elementary and high school uh, people preparing to teach in those areas. Most people in our country do not remember before third grade. They're perfectly happy to do what I'm doing now. And that doesn't feel bad to them because that's all they, that's as far back as they remember. Um, to teach in a way that we are seeing here where it looks like you're not there, like adults aren't there, it's so hard. So come, having come out of trying to develop the notion of an open classroom, I, I want to say to you, this, this is work that we need to continue to talk about in the way that these teachers talk every day about what they're seeing. They have gotten better. The work has gotten deeper. And I know it's because they have taken the time to talk. They have taken the time to reflect. They have taken the time to play and enjoy. And what the seat I, I have had my um, pronunciation of Sichik Mahali's name um, straightened out for me, but I, I'm still in my bad habit. But the notion of flow is critical to this. Um, I know just listening to the teachers, witnessing what's going on here, that they experience flow during the day in terms of their work with the children. They experience flow in the time they take to talk with each other and in those conversations with the children that we witnessed um, the day yesterday. Wow. There are, I, I have a number of, uh, yes, I have a number of references up and I just wanted to put them up so that you'd know if you wanted to go read them, um, read about them later. The one that I have up there is Pam Grossman and five other people, so I didn't list them all. But she talks about, it, it's an article that she developed that's in the Teachers College record, and it's about um, professional preparation, and she talks about three different areas where people are pre preparing. One is for the ministry and the rabbinate, one is for medicine, and one is for teaching. And what she said, what she, as, she, as they examine the ways people are prepared in these professions, they find that there are three steps. One is that they see representations of practice. The second is that they decompose that practice, that they reflect on it, they analyze it, they take it apart. And the third is they approximate it, they try it out. So as, as people are learning to do something, they try it out. 
I have worked with this, this trilogy that Grossman and all talk about, and I have watched in teacher ed program after teacher ed program, in professional development opportunities after, one after another, and what I see is we see the representation and we go try it. But the whole piece of analyzing in the middle of, of saying, now what did they do to get there, is what we, we miss over and over again. In, in Michael Fullan, when he talks about innovation in schools, talks about ready, fire, aim. And that's, that's in a way what, what we're doing. We, we, we see things, we try them, and we, we don't do the analysis. Angie is doing the analysis piece. And I think it's important that we not walk away the way I did, the way we all did back in the um, 60s and early 70s, of thinking if we got the materials or if we, you know, did some of the other things, we'd have an open classroom. The work with the teachers is the critical piece to make it happen. So I leave that one with you. Um, and then I mentioned to you Dewey's notion. Dewey has, um, John Dewey has this notion that the great teacher is one who apprehends the soul life of the classroom. That is someone who, who really understands what's going on in that classroom, the oneness with each of the children. Now this is not something that happens for a brand new teacher in the first year of her teaching. It is so hard. But if you have that idea that as you're growing, you are becoming more of a presence in the classroom, having real presence, having that, that interaction with the children. That's, that's a big idea, and that's what's coming through in the Angie piece, is this notion that they know the children, they have figured out ways to, um, to put things in their way that get them thinking about something in a different way, because they've watched and they've talked with each other about what they're doing. This is really powerful, and it's moving, I think, um, you know, with the five-year hiatus in between. Um, this is a, 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 a group of people who Dewey would be proud to know. Um, a third piece, you know, I mentioned Montessori. Um, the last one I think I will pull on, um, oh, and this morning, my friend Sherry Cleary reminded me of David Elkin's um, work on play and how important it is. Um, and this was before we did the brain research and all of that. But, but, but what, what he told us was how, how critical this was to developing whole people. Uh, I can tell you it is hugely difficult as I prepare teachers for elementary and high school to get them to do that kind of playfulness with their students. But, but it can be done. It, you can develop pedagogies that enable kids to enjoy being with you. <laughs> but we have to model it ourselves as teacher educators. Okay, the final thing I want to bring to you, and I hope this might be something that you might extend an invitation to um, Marlene Scardamalia at some point. Um, for her work, Scardamalia and Bereiter, um, they have done a, a, a really powerful article back in 2006, I think it was, Knowledge Building, um, theory and practice. And I want to read you just a piece that they, they have in this. I, I make my students read this and then we spend time talking about it because 
I think what's going on here is their vision of developing a knowledge filled group of young people who shape a society. Um, they find that there are substantial similarities between deep learning and the process by which knowledge advances in the disciplines. And we heard this morning about deep learning. They write that sustained knowledge advancement is seen as essential for social progress of all kinds and for the, the solution of social problems. From this standpoint, the fundamental task of education is the enculturation of youth into a knowledge-creating civilization and to help them find a place in it. I think Angie has begun that. Those of us who work with teachers, preparing teachers and supporting teachers, we have to find a way to help them do that at every level. We've got the, not a blueprint, but we've got a, a challenge to take this forward um, into our work with other adults, to see that when you're really teaching, you have turned the control over to the child by, by excuse me, to the learner by creating an environment that enables the learner to develop autonomy. And that begins the knowledge building environment. But in every way, um, the, the piece that David left us with is adults have a responsibility here to create the environment for this. So I really thank you for letting me pull this together.